great. It's really great to be here. And I'll second uh, Marie's comment that maybe the only good thing about the pandemic is that we get to see old friends and um, communicate with people in different parts of the world in ways that we don't typically do. So the title of my talk is The Medicine of Life, Social Life and Survival in Wild Primates. And I took the title from this quote from the, K the King James Apocrypha of the Bible, uh, a faithful friend is the medicine of life, which really I think demonstrates that humans for millennia have understood that there's something about the social environment that really matters for health in humans. And um, I think that's also exemplified in modern day research. Each one of these little pictures from Cebu to the, the Midas study to the Dunedin study or the Lothian birth cohort study is an example in humans of a longitudinal full life course study of health, behavior and survival. And um, human sociologists are very interested in full life course data because it can tell us about the links between environments and behavior in early life, environments and behavior in adulthood, and survival and reproduction. Um, from an evolutionary or ecological perspective, of course, the reason that environments in early life and adulthood are interesting is because their effect on survival and reproduction can tell us something about how traits evolve. What are the, what are the natural selection forces that shape traits? From the sociologist's perspective, the questions are motivated by an interest in how to intervene and improve human health. But in spite of the fact that these two fields come from very different perspectives, the questions they ask converge in ways that I think are really important and enlightening. So I'm actually gonna start my talk today by talking about social and environmental influences on survival in humans. And I'll talk about three aspects of the environment in particular uh, that are known to affect survival in humans. And, and then I'll segue to studies of non-human primates. So the first topic is how early life environments affect survival. The second is how adult social relationships affect survival. And the third is how adult social status affects survival. So with respect to early life, Felitti and colleagues cited here uh, in 1998, more than 20 years ago, um, sort of represent a canonical study of what they call, or what many human sociologists call, the long arm of early life. And Felitti and colleagues showed strong negative effects of early adversity on adult lifespan in humans. And in particular, they, took, they, they surveyed 18,000 patients who were enrolled at a healthcare provider in California in the US. And they asked them questions about their experiences in early childhood, specifically things like, was there drug abuse in your family? Was there violence towards children or towards other members of the family? Was there sexual abuse? Was there psychological abuse? And they simply counted the number of adverse circumstances that people answered yes to. They called these adverse circumstances adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And they found that individuals with six or more adverse childhood experiences or ACEs died 15 years earlier than those who reported no ACEs. So it's a really enormous effect of early life on survival in humans. And that study 22 years ago has led to a lot of follow-up studies showing that this effect is pervasive and repeatable and appears to affect all causes of death and many aspects of health. Um, with respect to adult social relationships, the study I like to cite is by Juliana Holt Lundstad, published in 2011 in PLOS Medicine. Um, and they showed that social isolation in adulthood is strongly associated with poor health and survival. That had been shown multiple times before, but what made this study different is they did a meta-analysis across 148 studies that included more than 300,000 participants. And they found that stronger social relationships are associated with a 50% increased likelihood of survival on average. Notably, the magnitude of this relationship is comparable to the difference between smoking and non-smoking, the deadliest health habit known to humans. It's larger than the difference between being lean versus obese, between drinking moderately versus heavily, between physically active versus inactive. So the thought is that. Um, you know, when you go to your doctor and they tell you to eat less and drink less and exercise more, 
Uh, they should also be telling you to tend very carefully to your social relationships because those appear to matter for your health and survival. With respect to the final phenomenon, adult social status, the study that I like to cite is by Raj Chetty and colleagues in 2016 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Chetty is an economist at Harvard, but he published this paper in a medical journal because of its profound implications for human health and survival. And social status, in fact, is a strong predictor of health and survival. The y-axis here is the expected age at death for 40-year-olds in the US as a function of their household income percentile from the poorest at the zeroth percentile or the first percentile to the richest at the hundredth percentile. These data draw on several billion tax records over a five-year period in the United States. And you can see that for both men from the first to the hundredth percentile and women from the first to the hundredth percentile, the difference in life expectancy at 40 is really striking. It's about 10 years for women and about 15 years for men. Uh, this relationship between social status and survival cuts across religious boundaries, national boundaries, cultural boundaries. It, it appears whether you measure social status as income, as education level, or as grade of work. Um, and in fact, sociologists, whoops, so you lose me for a minute or I'm okay. Uh, I'll assume I'm okay. Um, sociologists, good. good, thank you. Um, sociologists are so struck by this, um, by this relationship that they actually call social status a fundamental cause of differences between people, a fundamental cause of health differentials. Um, so um, these studies, important as they are, raise many questions. For instance, what are the mechanisms that underlie these relationships? Are the links causal or are they correlative? Is there something else driving both social status and health, for instance? What are the interactions among these processes? In humans, it's rarely the case that all three are studied in the same population. Um, and human studies face real challenges in answering these questions. Human studies are often incomplete or rely on indirect measures. It takes a long time to collect full life course data on humans. And most of these studies haven't been going long enough to get the full life course. So they either have the early part of life or they have the later part of life in which case the early part of life is usually self-reported and indirect. Um, and of course, in human populations, there's health habit problems. Some people smoke, some people don't. Some people overeat, some people don't. And there are health care confounds. Some people have better access to health care than others. So the, the difficulties, these challenges mean that gaps in our knowledge persist in spite of the wealth of data available on um, human populations in these questions. So my colleagues and I have argued for quite a while now that studies of wild primate populations can help fill these gaps and provide new insights in their own right. As I mentioned, evolutionary biologists and ecologists are, are asking the questions for different reasons, but the questions are the same as the one that human researchers are, are asking. So, um, most of the work that I'll present today occurs in the context of the Amboseli Baboon Research Project, which is a long-term study of baboons in Amboseli. This is the leadership structure of the project. Um, Beth Archie and Jenny Tung were my PhD students, and Jean Altman was my PhD advisor, so we think of ourselves as a nice scientific multi-generational matriline. Uh, and I'm in Amboseli right now, as you may be able to tell, I'm in a field office uh, while our team is in the field. I just arrived yesterday for three weeks. Um, this wild baboon population in southern Kenya has had data collection on it continuous since 1971. We conduct near daily observations on known individuals in multiple social groups. We have about 300 individuals at any given time in the population and about 2000 total. And we collect data on all aspects of sociality and environment and demographics, as well as biological samples. And in this talk in particular, fecal samples from which we extract steroid hormone concentrations will play a particularly large role. Uh, everything we do depends on this really remarkable team of people, both in Kenya and in the US who make everything possible. 
Um, and this is the field team that I've just come to see for the first time in more than a year. Um, and what I'm gonna do is give you five examples of studies in our population. Uh, well, four in our population, one in multiple primate populations, four of which shed light on similar processes, and one of which highlights an area of human difference or human uniqueness. So the four examples um, that shed light on similar processes are about early life adversity and adult lifespan in Amboseli baboons, about social affiliation and adult lifespan, about the intergenerational transmission of early adversity, what ecologists call maternal effects, and about glucocorticoids and survival. And then the area of human difference that I'll talk about is reproductive aging in females. So in each case, what I'll do is I'll talk about each example very briefly, and I'll start with the, the sort of main result, the punchline of the story. And then I'll backfill with some details and, and methods and more information about the result. So the first example is about the early life and the main result there as shown here is that the early life environment is a powerful predictor of adult female survival in baboons just as it is in humans. And in fact, this study led by Jenny Tung and Beth Archie was motivated by the Felitti et al study and others like it. So we had 189 females with complete early life data that survived to adulthood. And we measured six aspects of early life adversity, whether the individual had been born in high density, whether they had a younger sibling born within a year and a half, representing a short inner birth interval, whether they lost their mother before they were four years of age, which is approximately maturity, whether their mother's social status was low, was she low ranking, was she socially isolated, and did they experience drought in the first year of life? And we examined adult female survival as a function of these adverse conditions in early life. Uh, we built a Cox proportional hazards model with a cumulative adversity index as the single predictor. That is, we just summed the number of adverse events in early life, just like Felitti and colleagues did, and entered that number as the only predictor in the model. And we didn't really expect that much, but what we saw was this really astonishing relationship between on the y-axis, the proportion of individuals surviving as a function of age on the x-axis, if in blue, they had no early adverse circumstances, they were what we call silver spoon kids, versus if they had three or more in the red, and you can see the stratification of one event and two events in between. So these are individuals that had already survived to adulthood. This, this survivorship curve begins at age five. Uh, so these individuals had already gotten through the worst of these adverse circumstances. Um, the addition of a single adverse condition nearly doubles a female's risk of death at every adult age. That's shown by this hazard ratio of 1.9. Uh, if you had three or more sources of early adversity, your median age at death was nine years of age, as shown here. And if you had no early adversity, your median age at death was 24 years of age, a really huge difference and strikingly similar to the ACEs studies in humans. So that's example number one. Uh, example number two, led by my colleague Beth Archie initially, and then uh, follow up. Uh, is that adult social interactions predict survival among adult females and adult males. So the initial study by Beth was on females and then with help from Pancho Villavicencio and Fernando Campos and Fernando Colchero, we created a Bayesian model that allowed us to measure survival in males who, because they disperse from social groups, are more difficult to track across their lives than females. So we had over 250 animals of each sex in the model. And as predictors of survival, we included adult bond strength, which is the average strength of the grooming relationship that each individual had with its top three partners. We included their dominance rank. And as I mentioned, we built a, a Bayesian mortality model that allowed the incorporation of very heavily censored data, specifically for males. Um, we had a lot of missing data for males, so we used a random data imputation, which added noise to the data, and we were a little worried that it would 
uh, make the signal difficult to see, but um, in fact, uh, it did not. For both sexes, social affiliation significantly predicted survival. The y-axis here is the log of the mortality hazard. So higher values on the y-axis are higher mortality. Lower values are lower mortality, better survival. You can see that females have lower mortality than males throughout. But within males, individuals with low bond strength in this upper dashed line have higher mortality risk than individuals with high bond strength. That translates into about a 28% difference in the risk of mortality at any given age. And for females, it's a slightly larger difference. We measured, by the way, both bond strength with females and bond strength with males for the females. For males, they don't really have close relationships with other males. So this only reflects bond strength with females. But for females, it's both bond strength with males and bond strength with females, and you see the same pattern. Individuals with low bond strength have higher mortality. That's about a 35% uh, spread, I believe, in the risk of the hazard. Now, interestingly and surprisingly, for males, but not for females, social dominance rank significantly predicts survival, but it's a very weak effect and in the opposite direction to what we predicted based on the human literature. Recall that in the human literature, individuals of high social status live longer. Not true in the Amboseli baboons. For females, there's no effect of social status. You can see that because the dashed line is not different from the solid line, so you can't even see it. But for males, high status individuals have a slight disadvantage relative to individuals of low status. We interpret it, and the, the effect is small, but it's measurable. We, we interpret this to mean that by consistently pursuing high status, baboon males are um, essentially pursuing a live fast, die young kind of strategy uh, that is probably fairly different than how status works in humans. So that's an interesting potential area of human baboon difference that we could explore more. Um, I want to just point your attention to this paper by Noah Snyder Mackler and Jenny Tung and their colleagues in science published last year, where they looked for both social status effects and social bond effects across the published literature. And they found this is social bonds and survival. And we found so, so each of these little pictures shows a different species of mammals in which such data have been published. This is their phylogenetic relationship. And all of the uh, words in column D that are in blue indicate a pattern where individuals that have stronger social bonds measured in lots of different ways have higher survival. You can see that it's quite a strong pattern in many species. The one interesting exception is the yellow-bellied marmot, which is not an obligately social animal. They can be solitary or social. All of these other species are obligate social livers. And in the yellow-bellied marmot, increased network degree was associated with decreased survival. But otherwise, there's a, an interesting persistent pattern um, where social bonds appear to be linked to better survival. Uh, we did the same thing for social status and survival in the Snyder Mackler at all. I was a co-author on that paper, but um, Jenny and Noah really did the lion's share of the work. So I want to give them full credit. Again, here's the list of species. In this case, we have, and this is social status and survival. In this case, the blue words are all species in which there's a relationship between higher social status and better survival. And in the black is cases where there's no relationship. Um, in the olive baboon, there appears to be a relationship between higher social status and better survival. In the yellow baboons at the time, we didn't know. Uh, we hadn't, hadn't yet published the, the Campos via Vicencio at all. And in females, we already knew there was no effect of dominance rank. And in chakma baboons, there's also a positive effect. So the social status effect is more ambiguous and we need to understand more about it. And it may well be that in male primates, the story is different than female primates. All, all of these studies almost were females, by the way. 
So I want to recommend that you take a look at this Snyder Mackler et al. paper because it's an interesting comparison. And of course, the implication is that these patterns, both social status and survival, have deep evolutionary roots. And it, I think it really will pay us to understand these roots and, and uh, get some light shed on the origin and function of these links. So um, with respect to the issue of early life, adult environments and survival, we're taking some next steps that will help us understand whether adult social environments mediate the relationship between early life and survival. That is, is the negative effect of early life, on, of negative early life, of adverse early life experiences on survival because of a direct effect or is it because adverse early environments affect things in adulthood negatively and it's the adulthood that matters more. Um, the preliminary answer is that it looks as though environments in adulthood and environments in early life have independent effects on survival. They both have uh, relatively strong effects. We can replicate those effects in our data even three to four years later, but they're, but they're not the, uh, the, envi the adult environments are not mediating the effects of early life. Early life is acting independently, which was surprising to us. Um, yeah, so stay tuned. Uh, hopefully more will come out soon. So the third example is how the early life environment affects a female's ability to raise offspring. This work is led by my PhD student, Matthew Zippel, who just defended last month. And um, he was very intrigued by our 2016 results. And he wondered whether females that experienced early life, life adversity have lower rates of survival among their offspring. So he looked at 746 offspring born to 174 mothers. And he built a Cox proportional hazards model of offspring survival that included both early life adversity for the mother and early life adversity for the offspring. And instead of doing a cumulative model, he actually did a multivariate model where each early life, early adverse circumstance was entered separately into the model. And he found that a female's early life adversity strongly predicts her offspring survival in her first year of life, first four, in, in their first four years of life. Here's one example of his results. The y-axis here is the proportion of offspring that survive as a function of their age from birth to age four years, depending on whether in the gray, their mother did not experience maternal loss, her, their mother's mother survived through childhood or whether the mother did experience maternal loss so that, so that their mother was deprived of maternal care relatively early in life. He found an effect not only if, if the mother experienced maternal loss, but also if the mother experienced a close in age sibling. He didn't see much effect of cumulative adversity, which is why we stuck with the multivariate model. And um, no other adverse circumstances appeared to have this particular uh, uh, outcome. So we really think of this um, intergenerational transmission of adversity. Oh, and right, these effects are independent of whether the offspring themselves had early adversity. So we really think of this as a maternal effect. If your mother experienced early adversity, her mothering is compromised and affects your survival through the juvenile period. This is an unambiguous example of intergenerational transmission of adversity, which is something that human researchers are very interested in, but it's been very difficult to, to gather evidence about it. Uh, and as I said, evolutionary ecologists think of this as a maternal effect. Um, he, Matthew then duplicated this analysis with six other primate species, which are part of the Primate Life Histories database, which is a database that's um, directed by Karen Stryer at the University of Wisconsin and myself with the very uh, able and um, wonderful collaboration of people who study all these different other primate species listed here, including capuchin monkeys, uh, the baboons shifaka, uh, blue monkeys, the Gombe chimpanzees, the, the Karasoki gorillas, and these are the murikis of Brazil, which Karen Stryer studies. And um, 
we, he duplicated this analysis just for maternal loss, I should be clear. We, we didn't have early life data for all those other measures. And he found that in four of seven species, the effect of maternal loss was statistically significant and showed and or showed a strong trend. So uh, the y-axis here lists all seven, all six species, seven species, right? And the x-axis is the mortality coefficient estimate where higher values further to the right on the x-axis indicate a higher probability of mortality for an infant who who was born to a mother who had lost her own mother. So for chimpanzees, the result is just not statistically significant, but in the direction expected, it's statistically significant for murikis, for blue monkeys, uh, not for gorillas, interestingly, for baboons, not for capuchins, and not for shafak. We don't know what's going on with the shafak, but in both the capuchins and the gorillas, we suspect that the fact that uh, individuals often seek uh, interactions and care from non-maternal individuals, from individuals that are not their mother, may buffer them from the effect of maternal loss. In capuchins, there's quite a lot of allomaternal care. And in gorillas, because mothers frequently disperse to other groups once their infants are weaned, um, there's a phenomenon that Tara Stowinski and Robin Morrison and their colleagues have called social group, uh, social group buffering. And they have a paper that's in bio bioarchive. Actually, I think it's now published. So I encourage you to look for it if you're interested in showing that social groups buffer maternal loss in mountain gorillas. The fourth example, how am I doing for time? Okay, right? Yes, perfect. You, you still have yeah. half an hour. Okay, good. Um, I think I'll be done talking in about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, maybe. Okay, so the final example I'm very excited about, it's in press now in Science Advances. This says in review, but it's just updated to in press. And this work was led by my postdoc, Fernando Campos, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And he found that elevated glucocorticoid concentrations in adult female baboons predict early death. So just as a reminder, glucocorticoids are steroid hormones that regulate or support immune function, cardiovascular function, metabolic function, and various other things. Some people call them stress hormones, but that's not really accurate. A better way to think about glucocorticoids is that they are the first line of defense an organism has for responding rapidly to its environment in situations where it might need to upregulate or downregulate immune function or cardiovascular function or metabolic function. Lots of those circumstances might be stressful, um, but glucocorticoids have lots of other functions, including for instance, we know that when females are pregnant, when female mammals are pregnant, their glucocorticoid secretion gets high because maternal care is, 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 uh, is is prompted by high glucocorticoid concentration. So it's a, it's a regulator of sort of readiness and preparedness is the best way to think about what glucocorticoids do. Um, the prevailing hypothesis in the human literature has been that the way that social adversity, low social status, poor social connectedness affects elevated mortality risk is by uh, sort of chronically getting glucocorticoid secretion to occur and that chronic glucocorticoid secretion, as opposed to episodic glucocorticoid secretion, has this toxic sort of downstream cascade of effects that eventually lead to elevated mortality risk. It sounds like a good hypothesis. It's been very difficult to get support for this hypothesis in the human literature. So evidence is quite limited at the moment. And we think that's because in the human literature, it's actually extraordinarily difficult to get dense repeated samples of glucocorticoids at the end of life, which is, or throughout life, or really at any time in life. In human studies, human researchers, uh, uh, you know, repeated samples, a longitudinal sample is considered maybe getting three glucocorticoid samples over the course of a decade. Um, from morning saliva. And so it, it just, there just may not be enough power to pick up this very dynamic uh, biomarker. So um, 
what we did in our study, because we extract glucocorticoids from feces, we were able to get a very large sample of repeated measures of what we call FGC, which is fecal glucocorticoid metabolites. We had actually, this number isn't updated. It's about 14,500 fecal samples for, a hun for 205 females. I need to update the slide, sorry about that. And um, with those fecal samples, of course, comes detailed data on social and environmental predictors of fecal glucocorticoids. So this is what the data set looks like. Each row on this figure is an individual female baboon and each hash mark represents um, uh, a fecal sample that we collected for her at some point in her life. The red dots indicate females who died and the gray dots uh, indicate females who are still alive at the end of the study. Um, and uh, we found indeed, as I said, that elevated glucocorticoids predict early death. So to, to do this, we took what's known in statistics as a joint modeling approach. And a joint modeling approach simultaneously estimates two statistical submodels. One is a longitudinal model of of that, that predicts a longitudinally changing variable. And in that, in our case, the longitudinally changing variable is fecal glucocorticoids over time. So we put into the fecal glucocorticoid submodel all the things that we know predict glucocorticoids. That includes whether or not you're pregnant, uh, how long it takes, how long since the fecal sample was collected until we extracted it. We control for that because we know that it matters. Um, the female's age, Older females have higher glucocorticoids. The, the ambient temperature the animal experienced, glucocorticoids tend to be higher when it's hotter. Um, group size effects and so on. The wet season, your dominance rank, lots of things affect that. So we're accounting for those things as we simultaneously measure then the effects of glucocorticoid on survival in the second submodel. And what we found in the second submodel in which we included bond strength with females and with males, both of which we know affect survival. Annual rainfall anomaly, which is really just how much, how much it rained that year standardized to the average. So uh, uh, droughts are bad for survival, <laughs> not surprising. And then the area under the fecal glucocorticoid profile. And what you can see, and, and you have higher survival if there's more rainfall, stronger bonds with males, stronger bonds with females, and lower survival if you have higher glucocorticoids. And to estimate the magnitude of this effect, we simulated or Nando simulated uh, two females at the age of 14 years, that's shown here, one of whom would have had um, fecal glucocorticoids in the highest 10%, and one of whom would have had fecal glucocorticoids in the lowest 10%, uh, I'm sorry, other way around. This is the highest 10% in red and the lowest 10% in blue. And you can see that the simulated magnitude of the effect for two different females at age 14, who would then uh, consistently have very low or very high glucocorticoid profiles is about four, four years, four or five years. So it's a really big effect. <laughs> so again, going back to this prevailing hypothesis that's been difficult to get evidence for, uh, we think we've, we've found some evidence to support it. So we're very curious to hear how the human literature and the evolutionary ecology literature responds to it. So the final example, um, which I think I have time for, uh, is about reproductive aging patterns in primates and the, the sort of bottom line result is that reproductive aging patterns actually reveal that humans are quite distinct in how they age. This result is older now, we published it eight years ago, but um, it's such a fascinating and exciting result to me that I still like to talk about it. So forgive me if you know all about it and it's old. Um, I'm gonna start by giving a little bit of background on human biology. On the right side here, we have a picture of a Kung woman. This is a hunter-gatherer group. Uh, she lived during the middle part of the 20th century. And when these people were first contacted and studied by Western researchers, they were living a traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle with no medical intervention, no livestock, no crops. They were living off the land. And uh, it's thought that their mortality and reproductive patterns uh, represent uh, a naturalistic version 
of what humans look like when they don't have the extra calories from livestock or, or agriculture. Uh, they don't have that kind of activity and they have um, no medical care. On the left is a different uh, phenomenon. This, this picture is taken from Hawks et al. 2009 in American Journal of Human Biology, which just shows the typical reproductive aging patterns in human populations. And there's two different patterns that she shows here. On the left side are age at last live birth in three different historical populations, Quebec in the 1700s, France before 1850, and Utah in the 1840s. She chose those populations because there were good demographic data and because those were not contracepted populations. So women had natural birth patterns until their last birth. And you can see that on average, women in those populations, 50% of women in those populations had reached their last life birth by age 40. And you know, 90% had reached their last live birth by age 45. Uh, menopause happens about 10 years later. The four populations shown for menopause are slightly different. They're Minnesota, Australia, Puebla, and Norway in the 20th century. Um, but nonetheless, in spite of the cultural and geographic differences among those populations, they all show a strikingly similar, what looks like highly biologically programmed pattern where the last menses occurs on average for 50% of women by age 50. Um, and, and this is reproductive cessation in humans. Now, I wanna clarify that there's two ways to think about reproductive age. On the one hand, you can think about physiological processes, simply the, the attrition of ovarian follicles. And it's certainly the case that all animals will senesce uh, reproductively. Um, the question that we're interested in is not whether or not reproductive senescence happens in humans and non-human animals in the same way. We're interested in whether the scheduling of the reproductive cessation is different in humans from non-human animals. So to give you a, a picture of what I'm talking about here, um, about the pacing of life history schedules, the scheduling of reproductive senescence. I'll show you these data from Melissa Emery Thompson in 2007. The y-axis here is, th this is chimpanzees. The y-axis is the number of births per female per year. That's the solid line here. And the x, the other y-axis is survivorship and that's the dashed line. And you can see that, you know, survivorship, there, there's, there's a certain similarity in the scheduling of senescence and uh, of, of mortality senescence and reproductive senescence. In contrast, Emery Thompson and colleagues looked at the Kong population that I talked about in the previous slide. And there, a non-medically intervened population with no livestock and no, uh, no, no crops, um, their reproductive schedule shown in the solid line and the left y-axis um, shows that they increase in fertility until about age 28 and then they decrease pre pretty steadily in fertility until there's no births happening after age 50. And all of that happens long before most women are dead. Um, and so these look like different schedules. Both of these species are senescing reproductively but on different schedules. And we were very curious about the extent to which we could both quantify the difference in scheduling and ask whether or not other non-human primates do anything like humans. So again, we went to the Primate Life Histories database, which I've already introduced, led by myself and Karen Stryer with these seven species of primates. Uh, we added data from the Cone women, which is publicly available. And to measure relative senescence rates, we wanted to actually compare the probability of the event of death versus reproductive senescence in, in the same population of any given species. An example of what we were going for looks like this. So this is work from Bronikowski and Promislow in 2005, and they gave us our, our our idea of how to measure these two events. The y-axis here is the log of the hazard, the log of the probability of either death. And in this case, the example is women in the US in 1999 or menopause. And in this case, it's Australian women in the 1980s and 90s. And what you can see there so strikingly is that there's a difference in scheduling. There's a difference 
in the probability of reproductive senescence relative to the probability of mortality senescence. As if the senescence schedule in the rest of the body, which is in, encompassed by mortality senescence, is delayed relative to the schedule of, of senescence in the reproductive system. Now, in non-human primates, you can't measure menopause. And if you're curious about why, we can talk about it later. But what you can measure is last life birth. So we looked at these seven non-human primate populations and one human population, and we compared the hazards for age at last life birth and for death. And so what you're gonna see in the next slides is for each of the seven species, a figure that looks a lot like this one on the left, the y-axis is gonna be the log of the probability of the event, either last live birth or death as a function of age. And I'll start with the, the Kung population. Uh, this is the probability of the age at last live birth, log of the hazard, and this is death from the published Kung data. Now you can ignore the fact that there's actually two lines superimposed on each other. That's because we modeled the hazard in two different ways. It doesn't really change the result that much. We wanted to provide the technical detail in the paper, but uh, it doesn't affect the outcome. And this is what the data look like for the rest of the non-human primates. There's simply no evidence that reproductive senescence is happening on any different schedule than survival senescence. Um, another way to look at this is to look at on the y-axis, the 90th percentile for age at last live birth in each population. And on the x-axis, the 90th percentile for age at death. And you can see that the 90th percentile for age at death in the Kung is about 75 years of age. Whereas, and, and far offset from the 90th percentile for age at last live birth, which is about 40. As in most human populations, it's highly regular. Whereas in the non-human primates, the two just line up beautifully. So humans are different than other primates. Um, and I, I like this uh, cartoon that compares the reproductive history of Emma Darwin with that of Fifi the chimpanzee from Gombe. It was Ann Pusey and David Haig who designed this slide. I can't take credit for it. Um, the blue line is the life course and each red dot represents a birth. They had about the same number of babies, but you can see that they're scheduled extremely differently. Emma's birth intervals are short. Um, they start later and they end early. And then she has a very long post-reproductive life, unlike Fifi. Uh, what about other vertebrates? Well, there are two that we can compare uh, data on right now, thanks to Ward et al. This is actually a 10-year-old paper, but I don't know that there's an update. And it compares African elephants with killer whales. And I'll tell you in advance that in the African elephants, there is no difference in survival schedule and reproductive schedule. But in killer whales, there is. Killer whales do very much what humans do, where they senesce reproductively relatively early compared to mortality. So there's a lot on this slide. So let me step you through it. The left y-axis is survivorship for African elephants in the black dashed line and killer whales in the gray dashed line. The, the right y-axis is fecundity for African elephants in the black line and uh, killer whales in the gray line. And you can see that a large mammal like an African elephant is perfectly capable of reproducing into their late 50s and early 60s. And the orcas do not do that. So, the reproductive strategy that humans pursue is rare, but it appears that it's not unique. There are other animals that do this and understanding which ones they are and why, I think could teach us a lot about our own evolutionary history. And with that, I'll just end with acknowledgements. The National Institutes on Aging in the US and the National Science Foundation uh, have played a key role in, in all of the long-term data collection. And we have lots of people in Kenya to thank, including the pastoralist communities of the area in which we work uh, and several government agencies and um, a safari company that is our neighbor and great help. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I've got. And I guess I will stop sharing and open the floor to questions. How did I do for time? Not bad. I hope I didn't talk too fast. Uh, no, no, I think you did, and you said you would stick to the uh, around 50 minutes, and that's what I have been. So thank you very much. 
it is it's striking to see this and it's uh, impossible to not to subtract oneself to thinking of their own biological model and of oneself so but i will start so i would say so let's uh, let's try to see the first i think it was a first question by um by um oliver Hörner. so i if, uh, oliver if you want to talk so now you can do it please yes hi uh, can you hear me yes yeah, hi, Susan. Thanks very much for a super interesting talk, as always. Uh, I just had a, a question um, to, to your example three uh, on the maternal loss. I was wondering, coming from the hyena, spotted hyena system, where um, social status very much depends on the number of uh, supporters, social supporters you have, whether um, if um, in your system, um, when uh, females I mean, lose their mother, they also lose um, uh, social status, they are reduced in social status. And if so, whether uh, you would then still consider that as a maternal effect or an environmental effect? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I guess I think of maternal effects as being a special case of an environmental effect. Um, given that maternal rank transmission in baboons, as in spotted hyenas, is highly dependent on the mother. Um, the mother is both an environment and a particular type of environment. So I'm not sure if that answers your, your question, but I will just also add before you respond that, um, yes, indeed, if a female loses her mother when she's young, she has much more trouble attaining her target dominance rank, the dominance rank she should have attained, which is just below her mother. The more sisters she has, the, the greater the probability that she will climb up to the family rank level, but the lower the probability that she'll achieve youngest ascendancy. So her sisters want her up there with them, but they don't want her over them, right? The, the typical pattern in baboons and other serpentine primates and spotted hyenas is that the youngest daughter has ascendancy over the others. But in, in Ambicelli, that's only true if the mom uh, survives. <laughs> Okay, yeah, no, that, that's perfect, thanks. So it is similar to, to the hyena system then. Mm -hmm. Yes, I very much. I think, I think hyenas are just um, baboons that eat meat, or maybe baboons are just hyenas that eat grass. But it seems like everything that happens in the spot is, is just so much more extreme around rank. The effects, the consequences of the rank are more intense. I think because the competitive environment is, is more contest and less scramble competition. I'm curious about what you think about that. Well, I would definitely agree. And, and uh, I would maybe add to that, that maybe the hyena system is a bit easier to handle um, because the, the ranks, the hierarchies are more stable than in baboons. And a follow-up question, if, if I may ask, would be how you deal with uh, these dynamics in, in the uh, ranking in your system. I know you have done a lot of work uh, studying uh, changes in rank and the, these dynamics, but it's, I find it always difficult to, to um, create the models, do good analysis um, with... Uh, yeah, when, when things change over time, did you, did you yeah. um, assume different ranks at different times of their, their life to, to see if yeah. then the results are comparable? Yeah, it's a really difficult problem. When we can model rank as a time varying covariate, we, we, we feel confident in our results. Right. So for instance, in the, in, the, in the survival models, we modeled rank as a time varying covariate of survival. Um, if you're building a model, when we try to build models of what predicts, for instance, adult rank, where we can't really easily treat the outcome as time varying, because the outcome is just, you know, it, there just aren't good models for building time varying outcomes. We don't know how to measure female rank because it changes <laughs> all the time. Right. So I think we got the same problem you do, but we're working on it. Tell us <laughs> if you solve that. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have a question by Elise Uchard. Yeah, thank you, Elise, you should be able to, uh, to ask the question aloud now, if you want. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. hi, Elise. 
Hi, Susan. Uh, thank you very much for your fantastic talk. Um, thank you. And, and it's, it's amazing that you managed to have such a high quality connection from, from Kenya. I'm so very jealous of you being. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm so I'm, I was, I, I take it that it didn't cut out too many times. No, it was, it was fantastic. So oh, I, I just. Great. Yesterday when I was testing it, it was quite variable. So I'm glad it was good. Yeah, no, very, very good. Um, so I've, I've got a broad question for you, for you today. I, I, I just take the opportunity, you know, <laughs> uh, to ask you whether, do you, do you think from your own work and all your general experience and knowledge that um, elevated chronic stress is actually the main mechanism linking social integration to fitness? Do you think we've got the key to the answer, especially with your recent paper? Uh, or do you think we're still missing potentially key explanatory mechanis mechanisms to explain this link? Um, yeah, so what I should have said is that we have a paper out um, fairly recently. Um, but the first author is Stacy Rosenbaum, and the, the last author is Beth Archie, and it was in PNAS last year. And what they looked at was the links between fecal glucocorticoid as an outcome and social behavior as a mediator. And we can't find much link between social behavior in adulthood and fecal glucocorticoid in adulthood. We see a big effect of early adversity on fecal glucocorticoid. Mm -hmm. And we see, so we're, we're trying to synthesize this. So let me tell you what, what we know. Big effect of early adversity on fecal glucocorticoid, big effect of fecal glucocorticoid on survival, big effect of social environment in adulthood, social bonds on survival, but virtually no link, very small link. It's a small, I shouldn't say virtually no, it's a very small link between fecal glucocorticoids, between social bonds and fecal glucocorticoids. It looks to us as though the effects of social, uh, social behavior in adulthood and fecal glucocorticoids are relatively independent. So there's something missing from our picture that we haven't figured out yet. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot more to say, but I'll keep it short because I think that's the, the gist. There's, there's lots unanswered. I think that at least in the baboons, weak social bonds are not mediating the link between fecal glucocorticoids and survival. Or at Thank least not mediating, not mediating them very much. I, I, I'm, I'm overstating when I say there's nothing. It's just very small compared to the, the big magnitude of the fecal glucocorticoid effect and the social bond effect. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's, it's really, really useful, really enlightening. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. So now we have the question by Raquel Vasconcelos. Uh, Raquel, uh, if you want to, to, to ask loud. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation and for the continuous work in such challenging conditions. Um, thank you. So, yeah, so my, my question was about the, the last slides. I was curious that uh, what the reason uh, why there is this difference in the ah. humans. And uh, so can it be because uh, maybe there is a positive selection for a woman to take care of uh, the kids of younger women, uh, helping them in, in this, uh, well, made sometimes when they, they are not able to take care of all the kids because they have so close together the, the, the kids so in, in differences in comparison with the primates or if they are, uh, not there for some reason. Yeah, Raquel, you've you've hit exactly on the the primary explanations that most people invoke to try and understand the relatively early reproductive cessation of humans. Um, the 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 general idea is that um, women get a better fitness advantage by ceasing their own reproduction and investing in grand offspring particular, not just any, any other offspring, but their grand offspring than they do by continuing to reproduce themselves. Now, the models that, that explain how that mechanism work vary a lot. So um, Michael Kant and Rufus Johnstone have a model that invokes competition between the mother and um, her daughter-in-law, effectively, the, the, a woman who immigrates into the group, marries the mother's son, 
and and reproduces on her own that the competition between that gen, you know one generation and the next effectively um, selects for reproductive suppression, you know, like cooperative breeders, except that in most cooperatively breeding species, it's the younger generation that's suppressed, and then you mature into becoming a breeder. But the, the idea is that in humans, that pattern is reversed. Um, Kristen Hawkes at University of New Mexico has posited a different sort of positive selection on the women themselves directly for investing in their grand offspring. So the the mathematics of the models differ, but yes, in general, the, the models overlap in their prediction that fitness advantages accrue to ceasing investment in your own and increasing investment in others. I don't know if that explains the killer whales. I, I feel a little confused still about the killer whales. Lauren Brent has done some really interesting work on this, but I haven't talked to her about it in a while. And I, um, yeah, I, I'm not up on her literature, which I think is really about valuable. Them yet, but probably there's something related. There's some social bonds, family bonds that we don't know of in these yeah. whales, probably. Probably, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. No, there, there was a question coming back to the, to the point on, on stress hormones by Sergio Gonzalez. So Sergio, probably you can, you can ask aloud now. Yeah, thank you, Ignacio. Um, and thank you, Susan, for the great seminar. It was really interesting. And then now, based on the on the answer you gave to Elise, I'm also curious about like um, the interpretations of stress and how they um, build bridges to human implications. So if you see that, well, you've seen that maybe corticoid stress is not really a determinant in in adult social behavior in baboons, do you think that um, there is like this pervasive like interpretation of how stress should affect social structure from maybe an anthropocentric point of view? And if, if that's so, like what other um, lines of interest would you have in trying to explain this um, or how corticoid is, is actually um, affecting the primate behavior? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess I have a couple of thoughts about that. And, and as I said in my response to Elise, for us at the moment, it's still a really deep puzzle how all of these things synthesize to get to create the pattern we're seeing. So there's some answers that I don't have yet, um, but you're asking me to speculate, so I'll do that. <laughs> um, my interpretation is that, so in that joint modeling, and, and I'm sorry if this wasn't clear, it's actually difficult to communicate clearly, the, the effect of glucocorticoids on survival is not controlling for all those other sources of variation in glucocorticoids. It's taking them into account. So in other words, th there are lots of things that can elevate your glucocorticoids. Um, some of them are intrinsic, your genetic makeup, uh, well, I guess that would be it. Your genetic makeup, some of them are extrinsic. Um, some of them are life course events, how many times you're pregnant. There's lots of stuff going on besides social bonds. And it may simply be that because glucocorticoids are so dynamic and so responsive and so tied up in virtually every way that we interact with the environment, that the effect of social bonds per se is just not strong enough to measure. Now, in, it, it may be there, but its effect is swamped by its correlation with other things. It may be that in a species like humans, where the social bonds you have are probably uh, you know, predicted and determined in different ways than they are in baboon societies, you might get a different pattern. You might see social bonds popping out more as predictors of glucocorticoids. And I, I actually think that might be true in the human literature. I'm gonna admit that I don't remember that about the human literature right now. So I apologize for that. But I think nonetheless that the, that the, the same thing is true. I'm gonna speculate that the same thing is true in both humans and non-human primates, that it's the fact that many different things are raising your glucocorticoids. And if you happen to be unlucky enough to have a lot of those things hitting you time after time, day after day, week after week, you're, you're gonna experience eventually a deficit, right? In, in survival. Um, and any one of those things on its own may not be sufficient to account for that 
survival deficit, right? Does that does that help and make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's my best answer right now, but we don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, but it's really interesting. Like, um, maybe also like the association with the negative effects rather than maybe thinking that maybe corticoids are driving some trade-offs between survivability and other behaviors. It could also like, well, it, it's all really tangled up, so. I think well so but you raise an interesting point I think that um, you know one a number of evolutionary ecologists have raised the point that you know the appropriate comparison to make about fecal glucocorticoids is not whether or not individuals that have relatively elevated glucocorticoids survive worse than individuals who have low glucocorticoids the appropriate comparison to make would be within an individual if you manage to have to have you know have them be high glucocorticoid versus low glucocorticoid in the same context, would they be better off having high versus low, right? It may well be that, it, in other words, I don't know if I'm being clear, but it may well be that an individual who is not sufficiently responsive in their HPA axis, who doesn't secrete enough glucocorticoids, is even worse off than individuals who are who are responding appropriately. We can't say that individuals who die earlier are dying earlier because they're doing it wrong, right? It may simply be that they get more challenges than other individuals and they better respond to those challenges because it's better to respond than to not respond. But having to respond is bad for you, right? We, we can't differentiate those two possibilities. Did that make sense? I saw some of the people I can see nodding, but some looking very puzzled. So I don't know. Should I say more, Sergio? Um, no, I think I think that that's also like the point I, I was trying to get to that. Um, About trade-offs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I took from your comment that you were talking about. Well, yeah, you could suppress your glucocorticoid secretion, but is that gonna help? Well, probably not, right? You don't wanna <laughs> yeah. shut that system down. Right. You just want to have a mellow life if you can. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, Susan. Yeah. This. So I think I think it is it, it is late, but probably uh, Tomali Normand, we can take one last question if it is short. But for sure, I, I am afraid that even the question, the answer won't be. But but please, let's try. So Thomas. Hi. Um, I'd like to, to come back on the third example where um, you got those strong maternal effects. And I'm not sure what you really have in mind uh, about them, but I was wondering whether, well, of course it could be genetic or epigenetic or environmental. And uh, I was wondering whether there was some ways to, to, to disentangle those, those possibilities. And because of course it, it would have very different implications. And, uh, consequences. I love that question. Thank you for answering it. And I'm sorry, because Ignacio is right. It's not going to be a short answer, but I will try. So um, our first hypothesis that we're testing now is that the effect occurs because mothers, because mothers who themselves experienced maternal loss or a close in age SIB have compromised maternal care that something about the experience of reduced maternal care in their early life translates into poorer quality maternal care when they produce their own offspring. So far, we have no support for that hypothesis. Um, we've collected about eight months worth of data on very detailed mother-infant interactions. We can't detect any difference in suckling time. We can't detect any difference in carrying time. We can't detect any difference in grooming time, all the sort of obvious ways. We don't affect detect differences in maternal attentiveness, responsiveness. The one thing that we're seeing, which is surprising, that, that is, and this isn't published yet, but we hope it will be within the next year, is that females who had more early adversity spend more time around adult males when they have neonates. And the consequence of spending more time around adult males, and, and that's an effect that doesn't surprise us terribly. We kind of had some clues that that was true. Um, but but the, the consequence of having more adult males around, if you yourself are a neonate, is that you spend 
more time being active, more time off the nipple, more time playing, more time in positive interactions, more time in negative interactions. You're just stimulated more. And it may be that that turns out to be good for you because having those males around and having you be socially developed at an earlier age has a long-term survival benefit. It may be that being overstimulated is bad for infant survival. It's gonna take us 15 years to answer that question, but we're hoping to continue collecting those detailed mother infant data. So thank you for asking that question because it's a great question. We don't, our guess is not epigenetic. Um, it looks like a pretty classic ecological maternal effect, but, but we don't know. It could, be, it could be moderated by epigenetic effects. It's, it's completely possible. Good. I think I'm. I think I'm afraid we need to uh, to stop here uh, with the questions. Um, thank you very much for the for for, for, the, for the talk. It's a uh, there's a lot of um, food for thought, including for oneself, which is not minor. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and tend then, to your friendships. <laughs> I, 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 as as much uh, as much as we can in the in the lockdown. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much again, and then looking forward to see you next um, Friday. We stick to the original um, uh, schedule, as uh, Emmanuel said at the beginning. So next Friday, with the, the talk by Suti Day on population size and adaptation in bacteria. I take care in the meantime. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks, Jen. Marie. It thanks was so great to see you and to yeah, get a chance yes, to chat yeah. at least briefly. I'm very and happy to see you too. It was yeah. so